Uh, Ted Hoff is going to tell, tell us a little bit about that. So Ted, maybe you can tell us first of all about um, how, where you went to school and how you ended up in California. Give us a kind of a snapshot of that. Well, I grew up outside of Rochester, New York, and uh, went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute for my undergraduate work, got a bachelor's in electrical engineering in 1958. And as a senior, I applied for a National Science Foundation fellowship and was fortunate enough to win one. And I looked at that as a ticket to just about any place. I don't think I'd been more than a few miles west of Niagara Falls <laughs> in my whole life. Decided to come out to California and I picked Stanford because I'd heard so many good things about it. So I came out to Stanford in the fall of 1958. And uh, it was a great time to come. I mean, you could drive from Stanford to San Jose, and it was orchards the whole way. Yeah, I and, remember those. <laughs> and um, it was also, I think, a good time because it was, it was mentioned here about 1959. 1959, there were two important patents applications filed, one by Jack Kilby of yep. Texas Instruments and the other by Bob Noyce of Fairchild that covered the integrated circuit. And that started part of the revolution that we talk about that represents Silicon Valley. So back in those days when you got out of college, the job market was pretty bad. Tell us a little bit about uh, yeah. that and maybe how that might have affected your decisions. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things, I, while I was going <coughs> to RPI, I was very fortunate to have a summer job at General Railway Signal Company in Rochester, New York working with transistors. And that started in 1954 when the junction transistor was only about three years old. So that was, that was a tremendous advantage having that. And I came out to Stanford and I found out, I had, I had learned in my work with transistors that were a very key paper that had been published about switching phenomena in transistors by two researchers at Bell Labs, and one of them had just been hired by Stanford to join the faculty. Ebers so and that was John Mole, and I rushed to sign up for his course. And I think that was probably the first time I really understood what was going inside, going on inside one of those little device packages. So how much did it cost the National Science Foundation to send you to Stanford? Yeah. I, <laughs> Stanford's tuition was $1,005 a year, and the, the fellowship included a bit of a living allowance, and I was on it for about four years, you know, on the government dole. Oh, yeah. but, I, but I look, you know, how much of the income I've had over the last 50-some years I can attribute to that Stanford PhD, and how much extra income tax have I paid, and I figured I have paid that thing back hundreds of times over. <laughs> so you, you taxpayers made a good investment there. I remember uh, when I was an undergrad at Stanford, I went in, uh, oops, we hit the ca cable again here. Uh, I'll get it. Over I'll get it. Okay. Um, my tuition was paid by the state of California. I had a uh, scholarship from them. And Stanford's tuition was $320 a quarter. And I was able to cover that through my, uh, my scholarship, which was kind of nice. So talk about some of the key uh, events in, during the 60s uh, that, um, where you, well, first of all, when you got your PhD, what did you do then? Yeah. Well, actually, let me back up a little bit. Okay. I came out to Stanford. I did, um, you know, the usual program where you get a master's degree. I went back to that summer job in Rochester for one summer, and while there I learned one of the big problems in railroading is they can't keep track of where the rolling stock is. And somebody said, wouldn't it be nice if someone could design a system to read the serial numbers off of railroad cars as they go rolling by? Wow. So I come out to Stanford now after one year here, back from the summer, to join the Ph.D. program. And John Linville, head of the E department, says, have you got anything you'd like to work on? And I said, well, you know, I mentioned this problem. It would be interesting to build a system to do that kind of, you know, reading phenomena. And he said, said, I've got just the guy for you. And he introduces me to Bernie Woodrow, who had Bernie just Woodrow. joined the faculty from MIT and whose specialty was adaptive systems and pattern recognition. 
So we started working together. We developed the LMS algorithm, which we published in around 1959-1960 time frame. We developed an analog memory device mm -hmm. uh, based on electroplating, and um, that led, you know, that's what I got my PhD in. And then I stayed on as a postdoc doing research under government programs. Was that uh, classified research then at that some time? Some of it was classified. I know there's always been controversy <laughs> about that. What, what the classification allowed us to do was have access to real data that was generated from sensitive sources. Okay. So if we're doing pattern recognition, let's say, like in a sonar array, in other words, you want to make an adaptive sonar <laughs> imaging system. Well, we could get real data from the Navy off their, off their submarines to use if we had a classified place to keep it. And that was, that was what was involved. So there was a lot going on in the, uh, the electronics research lab uh, building there, and you were working yeah. on that as a uh, well, I had occasion, post postdoc. Yeah, yeah, I had occasion to work in the electroplating shop to develop this analog memory device and there were some other interesting things going on in that in that shop. The John Meehan was the fellow who ran it. He was making ruby lasers mm -hmm. by coating them with just the right amount of silver to get a certain degree of reflection. He was making microwave cavities which he would do by having a piece of aluminum machine to a certain shape, then plate it with copper, and then use acid to dissolve the aluminum out from inside, so now he's got a cavity in the copper mm -hmm. that's exactly the shape that the researcher wants. And there was work going on in traveling wave tubes or glass blowers and so on. So it was a very interesting uh, place to, to work uh, at, at Stanford, and uh, had, had, a, had a lot of fun there. <laughs> So they fired up uh, the Stanford Linear Accelerator. I remember uh, riding my bike out and studying there in the spring afternoons while they were doing the construction. Yeah. Well, actually, there was a small, I believe, linear accelerator right next to the ERL belt. Yeah, the Mark III. Yeah, and every morning, I believe, they would run the backup generators, and they had this big array of lights that they used as a load on the generator, and they would tested every day, I guess, to do that. I remember the, the roar that that thing made <laughs> when they fired it up. And that was, uh, uh, we started seeing a lot of that on the campus, the expansion of that linear accelerator technology that Bill Hansen worked on. And um, I originally worked at Lincoln Electric, but uh, that was one of the companies making microwave radio uh, transmission equipment for replacing telephone lines along the Southern Pacific right away down the Central Valley. And, Southern Pacific be became, the SP became part of Sprint, so that as the uh, telephone companies deregulated, that became uh, an application of microwave in that area. So what other local companies come to mind that you were involved in or know about in those days? Well, I mean, we had a number of students who were on co-op programs from companies like, I believe, um, uh, Hewlett Packard, I believe Lockheed had some, mm -hmm. and so um, that tie between the university and industry seemed to be very significant. Um, it, it tended to make, I think, the electrical engineering education more linked to practical things than you might have otherwise. Mm -hmm. And it, meant, it was mentioned traveling wave tubes. We've already seen I have one slide showing uh, the you know basic operation of a traveling wave tube. But I think we've already talked about that. But another another thing that was mentioned was the klystron, and that was used to build linear accelerators. I have a little klystron that I brought along with me. This is a World War II reflex klystron. I think we have a slide if we can show how that. <laughs> wait, where did you get that? From? Yeah, that's the next slide. Where did you uh, pick that one up? Was that out of your collection? This is out of my collection. I've had it for years. It probably dates to World War II, and there used to be a lot of surplus stuff. I actually had it fired up once. Uh, the way these work, uh, an electron beam goes up the tube through a cavity in the middle, which is adjustable, and this runs at about 3 gigahertz. The top electrode is a repeller electrode, so the electron beam goes through, turns around, and goes back down. And as it goes through the cavity, the electron <coughs> velocity gets modulated. And as it goes up and turns around, 
the fast electrons catch up with the slow ones. So when they go back through the cavity, they go through in a bunch, and they excite the cavity and cause it to oscillate even more. So that's the basic principle of an oscillator. This would have probably been used as a you know, local oscillator and a micro microwave radar receiver. <laughs> so what other technologies led up to the, uh, the semiconductor industry or were adjacent to it before we really get into the Intel stuff? Well, actually, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the other stuff because the, when we see what semiconductors have done, we'll see where we came from. One of the things that we had going on at Stanford in those days, we had, I mentioned government contracts, and one of our contractors was Hunts, the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama. <laughs> now, to give an idea, we, we're pretty used to high-speed data communication these days. And by the way, this is a reel of magnetic tape made by a local company, Memorex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, we found when we needed to send data to Alabama, it was cheaper and faster to put it on a reel of magnetic tape like this, drive to San Francisco Airport, and put it on an overnight flight than it would be to send it over the telephone lines, which we could have done. But putting it over the telephone line would have cost far more, and it would have taken longer than that airplane flight. <laughs> <laughs> that was life in the 60s. <laughs> Good old FedEx, pre precursor to FedEx, I suppose. Batch communication. Batch. <laughs> Sneaker net. Yeah. So uh, what else in the memory uh, area? Well, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things at Stanford, we first had an IBM 1620 computer, and then about the mid-60s, we replaced it with an IBM 1130. And the uh, IBM 1130, in fact, one of the key inventions out here in the mid-50s was IBM invented the disk drive. Now, by the 19... In the mid-60s, they had improved the disk drive to where it was a removable cartridge. And here is a cartridge of the type we used with the IBM 1130 computer. Now, I might point out, this cartridge would hold about maybe a couple of megabytes. When you talk about semiconductor technology, I don't know if you can even see this. That is a it's micro, a micro SD. SD card. Now consider that this thing, its volume and its weight is about 10,000 times that of this micro SD card. But the micro SD card stores about 10,000 times as much information as this disk cartridge could. <laughs> that is the kind of progress that has been made in semiconductor memory. And that cartridge was patented by Memorex? That, I have a copy. If you look at this cartridge, you'll see on the bottom there is a little sticker. And it has a patent indication on it. So I looked up the patent. And it was filed in 1967, issued in 1969 to Memorex of Santa Clara, California. <laughs> there you go. So, so what was the price difference? So, um, 